The Innovations in Soil Science presentations are funded by the Australian Government's National Land Care Program and was delivered by Soil Science Australia, Agriculture Victoria and Gecko Clan Land Care Network. The following presentation is introduced by Brad Coston from Agriculture Victoria. Just want to introduce Jim Shovelton from Meridian. So um, Jim's going to give us a talk about uh, soil carbon and um, making, the, making the best use and testing to grow soil carbon. So I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Yeah, it really is great to see so many people here. Um, I think when we talked about this, we weren't too sure how many we get. Um, so really great. And it's obviously a need to have a bit of a forum to talk about this sort of soil fertility and, and, and soils generally. So great, great to see people here. Um, I've got to say, I really enjoyed um, Jason's talk. Um, you know, somebody apparently said, well, what's going to be innovative about the talk? I think the stuff that Jason's talked about is innovative and it's really caused us to rethink a lot of the stuff we've been doing. So, Jason, I think that's been a great introduction. I'm probably not going to incorporate everything you've said, but uh, I'm working on it. Um, so, look, what I... I mean, one of the questions I often get asked when I go around is, well, what about soil carbon? Should we be farming soil carbon? Is that a fairly common... Is that, is that in front of people's minds? No, people don't talk about it. Yeah. So what I what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time on on soil carbon, the practicalities of it, um, and and then segue into well, if we if if we're going to grow soil carbon, um, how do we do it? So all this sort of stuff started off because you had Ross Garno saying, well, we can make exceptional contribution to climate action by creating natural systems to store more carbon in soils. What we do? Um, we would have uh, peace in uh, Ukraine if, if Russia wasn't there. Um, and then f f figures like this, we could reduce Australia's emissions by four to 16 per cent. And so the question what I want to do is just talk about is really how realistic is that and how does that sort of stuff fit into the, um, the, the carbon credit union, uh, credit union, sorry, <laughs> carbon credit units that the government puts out. So um, if you look at the, the, the question is how realistic is it to increase soil carbon? And there are a number of absolute limiting factors. So things like the soil, the clay content, um, and the depth of soil you've got to play around with. That's, that's the sort of the, the baseline level. Put on top of that, what you can possibly get is the environment. So solar radiation, climate, whatever, rainfall, all that sort of stuff that interacts with the soil type. Then, um, the, the things that they actually limit you getting that is, well, is your management. So, uh, have you got erosion? What's your agronomy like? What's your rotation? What are your disease? Um, you know, the soil is compacted or whatever. So, that, that, those limiting factors get you to actual soil, soil organic matter content. So if you put opt optimal management onto it, you can get to what the, the, the line there which says attainable. And if you want to go beyond that, you've got to start adding stuff extra. So you can see where the soil organic carbon is. It's in the high rainfall areas. And it's more in the clay soils than it is in the lighter soils. And probably for about, um, you know, the, the really well develop soils in the clay source, your limit is probably about 4.5% organic carbon. So that sort of limits you in terms of where your potential sitting. The only other way you can do it is to uh, is start adding stuff. And so this is some really old data, well not old data, but it's an old trial at UK. And this is sort of the normal track practice. This is where they started organic matter, uh, adding organic matter manure. Uh, and you see it plateaued at a particular point. So the other thing to realise is that there is a limit to how much soil carbon you can put in the soil. It will, it will, will stabilise at the level of management and the, and the level of inputs that you're putting into the system. And this is really important, I think, for people looking at whether or not they're building up soil carbon in their pastures. Because if you don't keep doing what you were doing, you'll go back to where you were. And that's what happened... Oh, wrong one. That's what happened here where they, they stopped putting the stuff on and over time it trended back to the zero. So the only thing about the permanence of soil carbon is you keep doing what you were doing. And if you've increased soil carbon by a particular management practice, you've got to keep doing it. 
So if we then look at, so, so, so there's really only two ways of, of increasing soil organic carbon. One is to add it artificially and the other way is to grow it. So um, if we look at some of the modelling that was done by a guy called Jeff Baldock from CSIRO in, in uh, South Australia, and this was modelled in, uh, around the ass area. So what he's saying here is that we're, we're at 2.1, uh, whatever the unit is, percentage of, of, of carbon in the soil. If we want to get it up to 2.6 or 7, we need to be producing about 15 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year. Steady state was about sitting at about eight tonnes per hectare per year. So this doesn't take into account the fact that you might have a tough year and you get a drought and you lose organic matter. And it also assumes that whatever you did to get that level of production, that you keep doing it for that period of time. And these are obviously pretty unrealistic figures to be looking at. So you will have seen there's a whole lot of people um, or oh, movements and whatever that are going around saying, well, if you do all these things, you're going to increase your soil carbon. So this is some data from uh, uh, New South Wales. And, and this was paired paddock stuff. So this, there's a bit of error around it. But what they looked at was the comparison between a number of different pasture systems. So native and introduced, um, annual and perennial, continuously grazed or rotationally grazed, control or pasture cropping, unimproved or fertilisers. The only one that was significant was putting some fertility into the system by the fact that it was growing more, more, more pasture. So what I'd like to do is that take a bit of a deeper dive into what some of the research says, which is more detailed and a bit more, um, a bit more precise, if you like. This, this was a trial that was started at Hamilton in 77. And what they did was that they, um, it was a long-term fertiliser grazing trial. Uh, it started in 77, as I said, on land that had an Olsen P of about four. What they did was they applied each year, well, the, the one that the, the control basically didn't get any fertiliser. But there were um, annual applications of four, 8, 15, 23 and 32 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare and what they did was that they adjusted the stocking rate to match the feed that was produced. Now I thought beauty, this here's a real example of where we can use pasture improvement to demonstrate we've got really good soil organic carbon increases. Okay, after 25 years trend but no statistical differences in soil carbon between fertility treatments. Now this is despite the fact that at the low fertiliser rate, you're probably producing about four tonne per hectare and up to 16 tonne per hectare on the high fertiliser rate. Um, stocking rate was three times and, and certainly pasture composition changed. But, but so there was big differences in production and yet statistically there was no measurable difference. And this is fairly simple, this is similar to work from New Zealand where the same thing over 20 years with difference in fertilisers, no increase in soil, no measurable increase in soil carbon. And so this is what the, the data looks like. So from 0 to 10 to, uh, sorry, and this is after 25 years and, and 0 to 30. So these are the fertiliser application rates along here and these are the fertiliser application rates along here. So this, these, each of these figures here is where the thing has ended up after 25 years. And, you know, yeah, this, you know, it, it's not consistent. So the real problem you've got is actually demonstrating, I think, even over that time frame, that you've actually got an increase in soil carbon. And in fact, if they do the modelling on it, to be confident you've got a soil carbon increase for something like the, um, at the high rate of fertiliser, which was there, you would need um, something like about 30 years of that treatment to be confident that you've got an increase in soil carbon. At this lower rate, 
80 years. So um, it's a slow burn. Let's have a look one that's a little bit closer to home. Uh, way back in 1915, the, um, uh, the department at Rutherglen set up a series of uh, treatments, such top dressing treatments. Um, some of them had lime, some of them uh, were just fertiliser treatment. I'm sorry about this, these, they should be different colours. So we had a nil treatment, and sorry, they've continued some of these going since about the 1970s. Um, it was interesting, Rutherglen wanted to get rid of the, the, this, this whole trial, and there was a bit of an argument about why we should keep some of this historical stuff. We had no idea we'd be using it for soil carbon. So it was just interesting that it, it, it's now been useful for that. So what they had here was 125 kilograms of super per hectare per year. And this one here was 125 kilograms of super every two years. Okay, And they analysed it after 100 years. So the annual increase in soil carbon was about 0.01% per year, um, or 1% 1 over 100 years. Now that probably occurred fairly early in the system, but it's not a huge amount, is it? And part of the problem I've got, and it, it, it sort of ties in a bit with, um, uh, with, with just the number of samples you've got to take, and, and, and um, Sue Brigg is going to talk about this in, the, in her talk, but the trouble is you've got um, differences across the paddock, you've got difference in analytical methods, and be confident that you've got it, you've got to have high numbers of samples, and you've got to be prepared to accept there's going to be an error of you know, maybe 10, plus or minus 10%. Laboratory error, for, laboratory error for the organic carbon is about 15%, and errors are additive. So you can see why you, you could you could actually get the, the figures in the wrong in the right way to start with and the wrong way or the wrong way and, and vice versa the next time round. So the, that's the that's the problem of, of soil carbon as I see it. And so this is again a, a, some some work from from New South. I'm not I couldn't quite I, I lost the reference, Jason. But anyway, but this is this is the conclusion because of the technical uncertainty in measuring soil small soil carbon changes and the higher cost of stabilising any gain in soil carbon compared with this carbon credit earned, carbon sequestration in Australian soils as a means of offsetting a significant part of the greenhouse gas emissions is technically limited and economically non-viable at the current time. There was a review of a number of straw retention, straw, God, straw retention, anyway, cropping trials where they looked at straw being kept on the, on the soil. And so, at 25 of those, there was a small increase in soil carbon in about a quarter of those. But when you started to look at the microbial mass, the changes in response to straw being returned or not removed was much greater than the total soil carbon effect. And if you go down even further and start looking at the impact of that, of that uh, organic matter on uh, aggregate stability, Big changes in that, despite the fact that you weren't actually picking up differences in soil organic matter content. So soil organic matter content is important. My, my real concern is the ability to measure it in a practical sense and actually you know, sell that within the system is pretty bloody limited. And if you do, you've actually retained the liability. Because the person is, you haven't, you, it's no longer your carbon. And if you sold it to somebody, they own it and you've got to maintain it for them. So I have a very cynical view of this whole soil carbon thing. I'm saying soil carbon is incredibly important, but I think the fact of anybody making money out of it, in my opinion, is, is highly remote. OK, and, and one of the things I think is that if we're only going to grow soil carbon, we've got to actually put some nutrients into the system. Um, there's a fixed ratio of carbon to nitrogen in, the, in organic matter. And I used to work for a company called Richland Laboratories, and if we ever had a, uh, a, a, a total nitrogen test and a carbon, an organic carbon test, and they didn't come back at 10 to 1, I would send them both back to an analysis because it's tight. So you want to increase soil carbon, you've got to increase nutrition. Um, and same with sulphur. For all those nutrients, there's a relationship between carbon and, and the nutrient in, in, in particular. So that 
what I want to just just to segue away from that at the moment, and I'll come back to that because I say why this is important. If we look at in a grazing system the the, the drivers of profitability. In, in relative importance, stocking rate and stock numbers is twice as important as herd or flock fertility, twice as important as animal growth rate, and an animal growth rate is twice as important as carcass characteristics. And so then you say, well, what actually drives, what actually drives stocking rate? And to me, there are, there are three things that drive that. First of all is, is soil fertility. Um, all your nutrients and pH and stuff like that, the things that's going to be, uh, ho not hold back your plants that want to grow. Secondly, it's grazing management. And thirdly, it's, it's pasture species. And one of the, 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 the challenges that we had, we're, we've had a, a, for quite a while, is how do you know what your potential carrying capacity ought to be for an area? So back in the... Um, Back in the 60s, there was a, uh, in both in South Australia and Victoria, there were a series of grazing trials that were done. And these were done with weathers. Um, this is the South Australian data. And, and both the Victorian and the South Australian data were, were basically pretty, pretty much similar. So what it said was, if you take off your first 10 inches, Oh, sorry, Let, let's have a look. The, these red dots here are what was happening in the district. These dots here are what was being achieved in the, uh, in the grazing trials. Okay. Set stock with weathers, most of them. And so if you draw a line of best, not a line of best fit, if you draw a line across the top of those green dots, you end up with a potential stocking rate that says, you take off the first 10 inches, your potential carrying capacity is 1.2 DSC per inch of rainfall above 10 inches. Victorian data did a line of best fit, um, but they got a remarkably similar figure. So um, what that said was that most district practices are not capturing the environment, the potential of the environment. And, and this is where the, um, the trial site at Hamilton was, was incredibly instrumental, I think, in, in changing the way in which we look at where potential productivity is, what are the things we need to do to achieve it, and um, what are the strategies that we should be using when we're, we're starting to advise on fertiliser. So what happened at, at, um, at Hamilton was that... Um, sorry, go back a step. The department in the 70s developed this sort of um, response curve which said, okay, well, if we're at this particular point here on our pasture growth curve, we put this much fertiliser on, we get a bit more grass. If we know how many stock we're running at that particular level, that marginal increase should give us so much return for the extra cost. And, uh, you know, what that did was that it was locking people in at an Olsen P of about 8 to 10. Basically, you said you're not going to get more feed if you go if you go up the scale a bit. What was interesting at the Hamilton site, and we took a bunch of load of farmers down there to have a look at it, um, was that uh, where you would say, well, it's not worthwhile putting fertilizer on. These guys were running 20 20 years per hectare, 23 years per hectare, and they were doing it because they were actually fixing the problem and then letting letting the environment express itself by getting by getting nutrition right. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we, we took that and we set up four trials initially. And I've got to tell you, we had no idea what we were doing at that stage. Um, but on the way back, the, the, the comment was, well, look, it's all very well for them to do it at Hamilton. They've got better soils than us. They don't have droughts like we do. They've got better pastures. Um, and it won't work in our area. It wasn't until we turned around and said, well, okay, where is it? Where is the, the question is not, will it work to the same extent? There's a principle here. The question is, how well does it work in your, in, uh, in your environment? How do you fit it into your farming system? So I said, we set up four of these sites, and I'll just put up some of the results for you. 
So this is at Yay. Um, and, and sorry, this, the, this was the forerunner, these four sites were the forerunner of what was called the Grasslands Productivity Program. And, um, and, and, and the Triple P Program. What, what happened is that over a 10 year period, we had something like 1,200 paired paddock comparisons on farm from northern New South Wales into South Australia, Tassie, and through most of the medium high rainfall areas of Victoria. And the way we ran those trials, and the way we ran this one as a, as a forerunner to it, was we took one paddock where there was no, where we just said, look, use, use whatever you're gonna, whatever you normally do on that paddock. Stock it at the rate that you would normally run it at. And then we'll take a paddock, or in this case, we took two paddocks and said, okay, well, let's see what's missing. And let's add sufficient nutrients, put capital applications on, to, to remove those limitations. And then we went around on a you know, two, three monthly basis and said, well, is there more feed here or less feed? And if there was more feed on the paddocks that we'd fertilised or the stock were better on those fertilised paddocks, we, the, the farmer was committed to making a change. If they're happy with what was happening on the control paddock, they couldn't stay still on the paddock we'd fertilise. And what happened over time was that we you see, we just ratcheted up the stocking rate. And, um, yeah, so, and, and we actually thought, we'd, oh, it'll take, take, a, take a year to settle down and we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out next year. Within two or three months, we were having to make decisions about where the stocking rate went. And so as you can see, and sorry, this was, this was getting fertiliser. This was getting about 125 kilograms of super potash 3 and one um, this was getting 400 kilograms of super potash 3 and 1. This was getting 400 kilograms of super potash 3 and 1 plus lime. Now, fair, that was a bit better paddock, but we did get a very good response to lime when we put a couple of tri strips out on these other blocks. So there's two messages, I guess, and I'll, I'll just keep reiterating these. We, we kept the high rate of fertiliser on up to four years, and we didn't really change stocking rate. When we started this exercise, we thought, ah, well, we just have to keep, you know, we're locked into using these high rates of fertiliser. Once we captured the potential, then we pull back to maintenance. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, and I want to come back to this, unless you fix everything, you're wasting your money on the stuff that you put on. The other comment, just to, and again, just to talk a little bit about the um, uh, where potential comes and one of the strategies I think we need to look at is if we look at the stylized response curve when people used to run cutting trials. So uh, what we would have here is that if, if, if that was your maximum rate there and you got 100% of yield, um, if you put on half the rate, the cutting trial said you should get about 70% of the response. And that's why when, when they did those sums initially in the, in the 70s, you said, ah, oh, geez, you know, um, okay, we put a bit more fertiliser on here. Well, the cost of the fertiliser from there to there actually pay for itself by the extra stock we run. And as I said, the, the answer came back was, you know, bugger all, not, not going to pay. You're locking, you were locking ourselves into low pH, low, low, low fertility levels. So what I think was interesting, and we saw this at a number of sites, was a site at Longwood. So again, this was 400 kilograms of super potash uh, here, three years. It, it had been sown down, and what was interesting was that the guys had put out a test strip of 400 kilograms of super, and you looked at it, you say, well, there's bugger all there, why would I put fertiliser on? We started off with five years per hectare, and that was too much for the control paddock. We had to pull it back to five, sorry, six, we had to pull it back to five. What happened where we whacked that 400 kilograms of super potash on, as you can see by the time we got to, what, two years, we were up to about 13 years per hectare. This particular stage, it was a tough year, and, and I'll, I'll show you what happened after we got the rain when the cattle, these are the cattle here, when the cattle went back on. So one of the, um, one of the things that, if, if you go back to that trial, where 
if we said, if we were going to put half the amount on, we should get 70% of the response. We thought, well, beauty, this, should, this could be a good way of doing it. So that's what we did. We put half the rate on. Now, if, if those cutting trials had been right, we would have expected a response up about here. We didn't. So instead of getting 70% of the response, we got a third of the, percent of the, a third of the response. And what I think is what I think is happening is there were a couple of old a couple of old guys. Jeez, um, well, way back there were a couple of people back in the 60s and 70s said, "Ah, oh, you put fertilizer on, then you put the stock on till it'll carry them." And what I think is happening here is that unless you've got sufficient stock on and you get recycling of the nutrients, you're not getting the benefit of the fertiliser. So you've actually got to increase your stocking rate, you get recycling of the nutrients, and you'll be able to lift, lift the carrying capacity up. But you've got to get up to a threshold where the stuff is firing. And then you put the stock on it, and then you'll get that recycling. You'll get the, you, you, you know, your, your phosphorus will be recycling around, and all your nutrients will be recycling around a lot faster than if you're trying to do it at a low stocking rate. So, Again, this, this comes back to the issue of um, what's your best strategy? Half the amount over all the farm or double the amount over half the farm? Sorry? Yeah, I mean, if, if you'd done half the amount over all the farm, that's where you would have ended up with your stocking rate. If you'd done it with half over, half over, sorry, yeah, all over half, and none on the other half, that's where your stocking rate would have been. So in terms of the, 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 you know, the, the response and the benefit from fertiliser, again, fix everything and don't stuff around with it. And um, the point is, if, if you do it at a slow rate, you're not going to often see the response and you're not going to the, have the capacity or the confidence to put extra stock on. The other one I think is interesting is that if you look at the total, and, and people say, well, look, you know, 400 kilograms of super potash, uh, for three years. This guy, this is from the Upper Murray, this guy had been putting on 700, sorry, not 700, 70 kilograms of super per year for 40 years. So good, good, good soil P. This is a nil strip here. This is 250 kilograms of super. This is 250 kilograms of super molly. And, you know, I don't know how many of you guys have got your clients using molly, but it is a gross deficiency in the area. Um, when I, I worked at Wodonga for 10 years, I put something like, you know, 200 test strips down. I got a 60% response to molybdenum. And the, and, the, and the message I've got, again, it's, it's this issue about fixing everything. This guy had been wasting his money probably for about, you know, 30, 35 years just because he'd neglected to put something like, you know, 60 grams of molybdenum on. One of the things that came out of all this paired paddock stuff that we did was we were actually to get a better refinement of where potential carrying capacity would be. And what I've got to say is that these trials were stressing the system because they were all done under set stock. And we didn't let people move their stock off because we, we said, you're not, going to you're not going to con yourself that you've got the stock and you're moving them off just because it's easier to do it. You've got to keep the stock on there and manage them that way. So this is where we ended up with. So instead of now using um, rainfall as our potential, you know, 25, take your first 10 inches off and then uh, 1.2 DSE per inch of rainfall above that. What we found was that the better relationship was between length of growing season. And classic example would be that if we had a growing season of, sorry, if we had a rainfall of say, you know, God, what, 600 mils at Seymour, we could have the same and, and we would run oh, a growing season, you know, we'd probably get to sort of, you know, 12 DSE per hectare. If we went down to somewhere like Flinders Island where there was 11 month growing season for the same amount of rainfall, we'd run 32. And the beauty about this sort of system is it enables you to say, okay, if I've got a slope that's going to dry off really quickly, and it's only got a, a, lex, a month or two months less growing season of the good country, you can make an adjustment about where the potential is on that, and you can make some judgment about whether it's economic and what it's, whether it's profitable to, to kick that up. The other one that I thought was interesting was that um, 
Oh, sorry. And so, in, in really rough terms, the difference between a growing season is about three DSE. Each month of growing season gives you three DSE. The other thing that was interesting was that the paddock size, and this is pretty crude, I mean, the paddock size, again, there was about three DSE difference between big paddocks and small paddocks. And so I, I think this, to me, this is a really useful, really useful piece of, um, you know, benchmarking, I think, that you can go in there and say, well, where am I? And, and you can do the sums on what, what you think the carrying capacity is going to be, what you think it's going to cost to get there, and, you know, so what you're going to buy some stock, what the returns are going to be, and you can actually then get, uh, you can put some economics around it. So stocking rate not, is not, obviously not the only thing. Um, and we saw a lot of other things that happened during those, those trials. Oh, wrong one. This is that Longwood site. And you remember I told you it got destocked um, with the, when we had that drought in 94. Uh, and cattle were put back on after some opening rains in, the, in, in, um, in February. So this was response three weeks later. So here's the, the, the nil, and here's the fertilised paddock. Uh, you, you really wouldn't want to stock that, but this one was up and firing. So the other thing about fertility is that it does give you resilience. The, the paddocks that go into drought later are the ones that have got fertility, and the ones that come out of paddocks, out of drought earlier, are the ones with high fertility. And so they, th this getting the fertility up, not only do you get an increased stocking rate, but you get increased resilience in your farming systems. Um, just like to, um, like to spend a bit of, bit of time just on mollies, molly and boron. And I reckon that, um, and it's interesting, Jason, that boron never comes up in those graphs. That those sickness, you know, those cruel type things. It never comes up in that. But, but I, I reckon it's a real sleeper for this area, for these high rainfall areas. Um, so uh, these, these are just some samples from around the Warby area, so nothing really is particular. But I often find a lot of these boron levels are low to marginal. We know that the, uh, the pine... The pine plantation people um, always use boron in their um, um, in their pine plantations. We know that um, um, uh, yeah, that there's been uh, you know good responses to boron in Lucerne, particularly along the Warbies and over at Mansfield. A lot of the trials that were done back in the 70s didn't show any response. There were a couple that did, and I think part of the problem we have is that I think is could be explained by this 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 this, this set of research results from um, a guy called a couple of guys up near from Syro at um, at um, at these are at yes so just to talk you through it so what we've got here is lime and no boron Herb there's pot trials Herbage yield was 60, seed was 3.5. No lime, put boron in. Herbage yield didn't change, but look what happened to seed yield. Lime, now, and now we've, in a marginal boron, we have now dramatically dropped herbage, and there's bugger all seed set. Put boron back in the system, uh, we're back up for herbage yield, and seed yield is, is back right up where it should be. So I think it's a real, it's a real sleeper. Um, and I think if you're, looking for tr if you're looking for trace elements, geez, use the soil test as a guide, but I think if you're getting something that looks marginal or whatever, really pays, I think, to go and have a look at, at tissue testing. It's part of, the, part of the suite. This was a soil test that came back at the marginal boron level. The difference in year was about threefold, just in one foliar application. So again, this guy had been putting a stack of stuff on, missed one thing. That's why I think you've just got to be comprehensive when you're approaching 
you know, your clients and saying, I'm going to crank the fire up, crank your, your, fire, your pasture up, make sure you look at everything. If you don't, you waste your money. Um, this was a paddy here that was full of, bloody, full of dandelions over, near, over, uh, over the other side of the, the hills. And dandelions are an um, indication of a weak pasture. A um, bit, bit, like, bit like the canola example. So, uh, you know, the Western District, uh, the Gippsland, it's often considered to be a potash issue. I went back and sampled, uh, sampled for potash and came back okay. I thought oh, I've stuffed up the sample. Sampled it again, still came okay. Phosphorus was fine. Um, didn't have a complaint about anything else. So I then took a tissue sample and it was molly deficient. Now, what happened was that the, um, uh, the farmer ordered the uh, super and molly. Uh, the, uh, there was a mix-up in, um, uh, in the order. The super came without the molly, but the guy had some uh, powdered molly. So he thought, oh, well, that's, I'll just spread it on the top of the, the fertiliser. Uh, now, you can imagine that normal fertiliser will spread like that and a powder will shred drop behind. You know, here's, here's lucerne, calcium magnesium ratio varying from 2.3 to 8.4 to 1, no difference in yield. Um, on maize in the US, um, the, the range of calcium magnesium ratios, oh, you know, five, five lowest yielding sites, six to 22, or five to 16, and six, and the highest yielding sites, you know, basically the same sort of six to six to thirty, six to twenty-seven. So it, it's got into the folklore, but I just don't. I'm just, I, I can't see the evidence for it, and I think it's a, I think it's a bit of a distraction. What's more important, I think, is just how much you've got of each of those in the system. You could have one molecule of um, magnesium and two of calcium and be have the right ratio. To me, it's the absolute amounts that you're dealing with. So what, I, what I've tried to illustrate there for the, the stuff I've done there is to, is to fix everything. That's, that's the issue. Um, the problem you've got is that people don't do enough sampling. And however you want to sample it to what sort of depth and all that sort of stuff, people do not do enough sampling. And they will base their recommendations on one or two, um, one or two paddocks. And to me, the, the issue about fertilising pastures is it's about resource allocation. How do you get the best bang for your buck? So these are four farms that we sample completely. Uh, so one, two, three. These are the number of paddocks sampled. This is the very, you know, if I put a, a ruler over what I thought was needed for each of those, this is the variation we got. Some needed everything. Uh, some needed nothing. And so the question is, if you've only got one or two samples, how do you know you, 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 you're getting your best value out of your buck, the sampling? Because I don't, I don't think you can. Um, it, just the, it just shows you the risk of relying upon one or two samples for your farm. The more sampling you can get people to do, to what, for whatever purpose you want to do it, the better able you are to make sensible decisions about where fertiliser goes. Now, I know that's difficult from, from a farming. Farmers don't want to do that necessarily, but like Jason was saying, but um, uh, oh, so what I should do is just go back. So what this should be doing is to demonstrate that there, there is hidden potential in most of the farms we're dealing with. When we did those 1,200 paired paddock stuff, the average increase in carrying capacity we got was 35%. And that was on existing pastures. We didn't sow anything down. And it was under set stocking, so it was pushing the system. So 35% just on existing pastures. So there's an awful lot of potential there to capture by, by having a look at what you need and being targeted about what you need. So um, one, of the, um, one of the projects I think uh, Kerry or Brad might have mentioned was we, we had a trial or a, a, a project uh, last couple of years where we sampled uh, we picked two paddocks again, and we sampled one paddock on a 50-metre grid. And the other paddock we sampled 
as an average. And so what, uh, what we've got here is, um, well, just let's have a look at this site because I'll show you what that looks like. This is um, pH, so that's the bulk sample. This is the average of those samples that were taken at 50 metres. Uh, coal or phosphorus, and again, there's a message there, isn't there? 130. Uh, and potassium, 120 to 141. So they probably say they're reasonably comparable. When you have a look at the, um, uh, what that looked like in reality, the average was the same as that, but look, the, the, the red is really massive, massive to pot potash deficiency, the yellow is moderate potash deficiency. This bit here is, is okay. So again, I think that starting now to look within paddocks and look at paddock variation, you start getting an idea of where you can spend your money better. It takes a bit of, conf bit of convincing farmers to do it, but they'll know that there are bad paddocks in the patches in the paddock. If you sample that, um, you sample the, the bad bit and mix it with the good bit, you don't know what you're dealing with. If you don't need sulphur, well, you've got MAP, DAP. If you do need sulphur, well, you really suck. Well, single soup is probably the, the most obvious one. And then plant tests for trace elements. And blood tests for animal deficiencies. Don't try and pick up animal deficiencies from a soil or a plant test. One of the ones that I, I, I really want to highlight for people, and this comes back to the fact of, of potash deficiency. Now, and, and this has got implications, I think, in terms of when you sample. In a first year, urine, in a first year potassium deficient pasture where you've got no clover, what you see is this nitrogen response in grasses. And obviously you're sampling, you'd know not to sample those areas. The problem you've got is that when you get into a second year in a potash deficient pasture, you've got residual potash sitting in the paddock. And what that does is that gives you a patch of clover. The problem with that is that's, that's the level of potassium you're getting in the clover, pa in the clover patch as opposed to the, the, the area outside. So I think that particularly in cattle-based pastures, you need to be able to see this paddock variation, this growth variation across the paddock. If you don't, there's a fair chance you're going to hit a few of these and be told that you don't have a potash deficiency. And so my, my sample is, I, I don't, so this has got a couple of implications for me. I think you need to be looking at that. So. I, and I know there are these, uh, you know, ute-mounted things. If you're not watching for where you're sampling, there's a fair chance you'll just run across and get some of these. The other one is, I think that your best time of sampling is in spring when you can see these differences. And if I'm sampling, I'm not interested in that. That's the bit I'm interested in. So I will do a poor patch sample, irrespective of what I'm, you know, whatever method I'm using, but I'll do a poor patch sample. Because that, that, that's the bit I'm interested in, not the good bit. Let's go through some. So look, and you can quibble about these sort of figures, but anyway, look, j just put them in, you can adjust them up and down, but just as a starting point. So we're going to fix up lime for those, those three paddocks. I don't know. But, uh, look, j just take them as, uh, you, you might up the rate or whatever, you know, but, but I've just put those figures in there. So 1800 bucks for the first bottom, last two. Uh, you know, a bit more for the one at the bottom because it's, it's bloody shit. Um, okay. Uh, you know, capital P, we work on PBI. We want to get it up to 15, so I've said we're going to put a third of the phosphorus fertiliser on uh, for three years. So there's my, my phosphorus cost per hectare. And if I'm going to put potassium on, I don't think we've got good guidelines for potassium recommendations, so I've just had a bit of a guess there. But, but they're what I would say to, to, to fix up for potassium. So if I put all those figures together, my strategy is to go for the top four because I can top four because I can fix four paddocks as opposed to fixing the one at the bottom. And while it, it's desirable to fix that one at the bottom, 
it's probably been like that for 10 or 15 years. If I can crank up four or, fo four or so paddocks to uh, get them productive, then I've got a better cash flow to, in fact, uh, start, um, you know, putting more, ca more investment into paddocks that need more. So that, now, that, that's, that's my strategy because it's all about resource allocation to me. And while I'd like to do everything, I can't, but my aim is to get as many paddocks up firing as I can, um, rather than just deal with the one that's the worst.